The following program is designed to promote ground crew safety when working under and around helicopters during external load operations. This is not a safety training program and is only intended to be used with the participation of a ground crew safety officer, trainer, or other qualified personnel. All training and refresher courses must be done in accordance with federal and provincial regulations and the Canada Labour Code. Helicopters are versatile machines. Nowhere is this more evident than in longlining and external load operations. While most people are aware of the dangers of helicopter rotors, longlining and external load operations have their own set of hazards, especially for ground crew. The purpose of this video is to sensitize ground crews to the hazards of working around and under helicopters. We talked with those involved in the industry. Here's what they had to say. When the helicopter comes with the barrel, when it touch the ground, it releases the tension on the barrel and on the straps, and we just grab the strap this way and we make it loop like that. I grab them with my hands and I signal the pilot that he can go when everybody is clear. I probably step back a bit and my foot left the ground this way. And in stepping back, with the downdraft of the chopper, the straps on the ground just did that, and it cut me like that. Then when I took off, I went straight in between the two ramps. The guy on the side, they were fishermen from Newfoundland, and uh, they tried to, to catch me when, uh, when I was going out. But they missed me. And I was happy they missed, because uh, we will be uh, three guys on one warp and one foot. Yeah. That was not a good solution. I say, well, what can I do now? And then I thought, my radio, where is it? Where is it? And then I did that and I saw that. I saw that it was doing that. So I grabbed it this way. And then I contact the pilot. And uh, I took my time. Because I don't want him to drop me. So I say, hello, Bob. He say, yes, Michel. Can you put me down on the ground, please? So he looked down and he couldn't see me. So he slowed down and he saw me passing by underneath. Well, I was about, uh, say, 200 or 250 feet in the air. After that, the helicopter went down slowly and he, he dropped me on the ground. And I was lucky, I wasn't hurt at all. The pilot maybe took off a bit fast. And it's probably because it was a repetitive action. We, he was just watching for me to, to sign him uh, that he can go. And then after that, he was looking for the hoop to be above my head. And then he fly. But he never thought he had a 15 foot uh, straps underneath. I stepped back just maybe to be sure I was clear. And uh, that was the mistake. 
but uh, I never thought the, the straps would fly away like that. There is a situation that you can avoid. I think the key is stay calm and try to do the right things at the right time. Uh, that's for sure, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, I did almost everything right, but I get caught. So after that, uh, you have to, to stay calm and do the right thing next. Because if you panic, you're done. Uh, we're a three-person remote access heli attack firefighting crew. So we work on a lot of the smaller, smaller fires and you know when there's lightning busts and all that kind of stuff. Okay, there's a lot of different things that we look at when we get to a site. Um, safety of, of course is our first priority. Uh, the first thing we do to prepare a site is when we get on the ground we're obviously looking to make sure that we're down slope of the fire and there's a couple of escape routes set out, not one but two, so that if something happens we have to do a medivac for whatever reason that we have those escape routes set up. Um, it's important to clear a site. Um, we're looking for holes in the canopy um, just to make sure that there's enough room so that the helicopter pilot can see a ground crews, um, that communication stays open. When you come into a place, uh, what happens is, is any loose branches or debris that's floating around on the ground, whether that's anything from flagging tape to loose branches, um, it has potential of getting sucked up into the helicopter, into the rotors, and uh, causing considerable damage to the helicopter, not only the safety to the ground crews and the pilots. Flagging tape, lunch boxes, you know, water boxes, all that kind of stuff has to be properly stowed and dealt with. Um, also when we're on the ground, we're looking for hazards um, to ourselves, so we're looking for any danger trees. So looking for, you know, widow makers, large branches or limbs hung up in trees, any loose roots on the ground, um, snags. So we want to make sure that all that stuff is cleaned up because safety, of course, is our first priority. Um, so yeah, the first thing we do um, before we get into a helicopter is of course we sit down with a pilot and we go over hand signals. Uh, hand signals vary from pilot to pilot, helicopter company from helicopter company. So just so everybody's on the same page so that there's no mishaps with long lining and nobody gets hurt and everybody plays safe. Down, down. Stop. Okay. I should be able to see pretty good down in there. I'll lower it down. Don't you go? You're right at the tree line right there. Bring it down. How about 20 more feet? Yeah, you're level. Perfect. Okay, six more inches down. Six more inches up. Uh, All right, bring her up. Level, that's perfect, perfect. Perfect. Thanks, Brian. See ya. With long lining, our, our main safety focus is visibility and communication. Just so the pilots are aware of, of where the individual is and, and all other people working around that guy and in the landing or where our ground crew has high-vis gear and, and they're easily identified. 
Same with the Hill. The Hill guys have to be easy to spot and, and their partners are easy to see and everything. Then the pilot knows he's good to start lifting the turn up. Just so we don't have an accident. We, if uh, he doesn't know if the guy is clear, then he doesn't start flying away. Eh? We use not only radio communication, but we also use hand signals. We, we wave our hand over our head, and the pilot is, is looking down at us, and he, that's telling him to lower the hook. And then when you give a wave like this, he knows that the hook is, is ready for you. And then again, you, that's when you put the chokers in. And then you walk out of the way and get in the clear. You tell him on your radio that you're clear, and he and then he gives you the signal that he's that he's going to start pulling on the turn. Good uh, good footwear, good sharp corks is is another thing. So we have good footing in the bush and on the ground here in the landing. on the mountain and on the, in the landing. Clothing has to be in good shape so it doesn't get caught on branches and stuff. Landing size for me, since I work in the landing, landing size is critical. Room to deck all the wood also, and just a good safe area for us to work in the corner. Put some cones out, establish a safety area for the pilots to see. Keep our heads up too. From where they touch down, usually a turn and a half away is a good distance and stuff. Like they're putting them down there, that's giving us roughly I don't know, basically the turns. This landing, for example, they're landing down into the slash and landing the turn away from us. Even though there's not an incredible distance here, it's a, it is a tight landing, but the turns are landing away from us. If something was to go wrong, either something come out of the turn or if the helicopter was to lose control, it would all be going that way and out of the way of us. I think it's the most important thing down here in terms of safety around the helicopter. What do you like in a in a pilot? Land the turns nice, nice and smooth right in front of me, <laughs> so I don't have to run too far over the bank. Long line is the biggest help to seismic ever, just because. Uh, well, previously before helicopters and long lines, this would all be drag outs, so all the the seismic people would be uh, basically muling this gear in. So long line enables us to uh, cut down on manpower and essentially reduce the risks of basically all personal injury. So the only risk with a long line would be right here in staging hooking up bags. But yeah, that's right, all our bags are pre-packed for the last job and then we just load them up this high boy just so we can get to our next job and uh, be pretty much prepared to go. So all we gotta do is add in our special bags and then we're good. I would say the first thing you want to do is look up. You want to see which way his bird is facing. Wherever his 12 is, you want to be off to his nine or his three. So he's, if you're off at his uh, three o'clock, then he's got a visual of you no matter where you are. Because that's where the pilot usually sits. So always watch, as soon as you hook him up to something, take a look up, see where his bird is facing, and then step away and just let him have his path. And always have an escape route. You see it somewhat cleared out there, so I do have one escape route and where else. I can go up there and be safe. Well, we've just got the back gate down here. And basically, as soon as I hook up the rack, and I see which way he's facing, if he's facing that way, then I know I've got my bile right through here. 
and if he wants to turn through the wind, but you see, uh, <laughs> that's the nice thing. You gotta feel where the wind is coming from too, right? Because the bird will always be facing the wind. So I know physically every, almost every time he'll be heading out that way right now. So. Because uh, these batteries are pretty heavy, I'll bring a truck over, load the batteries onto there, and then just put everything aside. Once it's up on the deck, then I'll come up here, move all my equipment up that I need out of the, my path so okay. I can exit. Yeah, I don't want to be caught, be caught with him uh, with a full load. So. Well, we need the long line to maneuver our gear through the bush. It's too much gear for the guys to pack uh, throughout the bush, so we put it in bags and drop it at uh, separate locations uh, throughout uh, our line. Well, you got to keep your eye on that bag runner at all times. Uh, make sure there's uh, no obstructions around your feet so you're not tripping over uh, the ropes and whatnot that we hook up to the bag runner. And uh, make sure you're as quick and as safe as you can be to get that, uh, that chopper uh, on his way as soon as you can. Uh, I never really count seconds. I make sure it's done properly. Uh, the more you rush, the more time for errors. Uh, just be aware of the surroundings around you. you got to be on your toes. Make sure you know where that bag runner is and uh, have a little confidence in your pilot. You must have a hard hat, obviously. Uh, the eye protection because of all the, all the dust that gets kicked up. Earring protection because uh, after a while you will go deaf. And we just, a certain few unsaid rules I suppose, but most of it is protocol. But when he comes in usually, if I feel it's unsafe to grab it just because of weather, perhaps clouds and all the static that might come off the gravel pit, then I'll ask him to ground the bag runner. He'll just basically set it right on this bed right here. And as soon as I grab it, it's pretty much gone. It's good to go. If I had a shock, yeah, I've had a shock. <laughs> it's not too, it's uh, not too nice sometimes. How do we do it? That's the only really way is when he grounds that bag runner. Unless, uh, if you think you're good to grab it, you can grab it, but you better hold on. But uh, it's never really a big issue, you know, because it's once every thousand times maybe you grab that bag runner. But for the most part, he'll ground it first. called Heli Portable Seismic. So it's uh, the exploration for oil and gas using uh, explosive charges in order to read uh, what's going on under the ground. The helicopter utilizes the long line to pick up the drilling equipment and place it where the drillers want their shots to be put, put in the ground and we bring it to them. Uh, using the external load window that we have we fly the helicopter from the left side so that we can actually hang our body out of the bubble window that you see there and uh, we rest on our elbow and look straight down and uh, we can do vertical reference flying with the with the bubble window and place the loads basically where they want them uh, just as far as the safety concern goes often you know when the actual load is coming in or leaving the drop zone is when people pay the most amount of attention if you're bringing a load in and place the load on the ground and release the load at that point, usually people think that the uh, whatever hazard is going on is over. And often the empty hook is kind of more hazardous than, uh, than people make it out to be. So it can float through the drop zone, it hits somebody in the head, or it can actually come up and snag a branch on the way up and rip the branch right off, which would then fall and hit somebody. Or even if there's multiple people in the drop zone and one person responsible for hooking the load, the other people aren't paying attention to what the empty hook is doing as it comes in and it can swing around in the drop zone and hurt people. Well you have to have one guy on the radio for sure. That is a must. If things happen on the ground that the pilots can't see and there has to be one guy on the radio with communication with the pilot to let him know what's going on. That is really important. Because sometimes things will happen and a rope will get jammed or the bucket will get jammed or lumber will get jammed down and sometimes the odd person three, gets caught up two, and you have to have a guy on the radio to make sure and everything's free so you give back. the signals for the helicopter to go he can go it just it comes natural that the load just comes down as soon as it's on the ground okay you're clear I'll be pulling the rope down my partner's on the radio with communication with the pilot and it just it works so well it's the, the main thing I stressed before is that 
communication with the pilot. That's top priority. It's a heli portable drop zone here, and uh, basically, um, what you see here, there's a little bit of a slope on it here, and as the helicopter brings it in, we'll uh, always uh, kind of stay off to the side from the side that the helicopter will bring it in. In this case, he'll be bringing it in from, uh, from this direction over here, so we'll kind of stay off to the side here and uh, always uphill from where the drill is going to be in case there's, there's a problem if it comes off the long line or whatnot. And uh, yeah, just pretty much keep, it, keep an eye on the load at all times, and uh, you can't take for granted. Uh, he may have done it a thousand times, but uh, Nothing, nothing can be taken for granted and uh, if you have the luxury of a larger tree, uh, maybe putting your back to it if you can. Uh, at the same time, keep in mind of giving yourself an escape route just for if any deadfall, the wind blows anything down or... Uh, okay. And this is, this, this, is a, this is one of our biggest dangers, you know, uh, that, that, lo that, that load uh, to never, number one, never walk under that load yeah. when the helicopter being in. And, uh, yeah, safe, safety is... Uh, is the number one issue for sure. Uh, everything else is uh, secondary. Myself, I've been underneath the machine when uh, uh, our crews are flying them, and it, to, to me, it's like a war zone. It's uh, typically loud. Uh, there's heavy equipment uh, over top of you all the time. Um, it's it's a very very dangerous environment, and people need to be vigilant about that environment. And a repeat heavy lift, whether you're logging or seismic or any of those repeat heavy lift jobs, um, it's amazing the complacency that can happen um, with crews on the ground. And it's it's very we stress to both the flight crew and the ground crew. It, it's it's not a walk in the park out there. It's you're working in a very dangerous environment and to stay on your toes at all times. Typical uh, reaction to that environment is for people to rush, and we tell our our flight crews. To, to remind the ground crews on the radio that if they start to see a trend happening where guys are rushing for getting things, is to remind them we're here to play safe first and, and still continue the job and to remind them to slow down and, and take the time to do it properly. Uh, yeah, we go through a line every day. If you do a daily inspection on this assembly, just like the aircraft. What do you check for? Uh, any sort of time that he snagged a tree or any sort of damage that's obvious. It could cause problems. The line will get pulled on the inside. The line is just a vector weave. It'll pull it right apart. But you check through the shackle areas and all the mounting assemblies. You look at all the suspension points, make sure there's nothing cracked or obvious damage. Uh, this is the main suspension bolt. As the eye of the spectra comes through here. And uh, if any of this is damaged, you swap it out with your other line and attend to this one. Same at this end. This is your main eye up at the top. You look for deformities and wear. Check out your electrical connections. Yeah, another example of things that, that the um, ground crew should be really aware of is the, is the force of the downwash that um, they, they should be aware of debris. And when I say debris, I don't mean just little bits of dust and, and uh, cardboard and stuff flying around. Uh, a downwash from a helicopter trying to lift close to 10,000 pounds and it being about, you know, it's up around 20, 22,000 pounds is like a hurricane. So if you can imagine what will blow around in a hurricane, that's what you can imagine and what you should be prepared for when you're preparing the site and make sure that that stuff is not coming at you. Part of your operational briefing should be first aid and what you're going to do in the event of an accident or an injury. You need to know the location of all your first aid equipment on the site. Uh, who is qualified to give first aid on the site. 
who you're going to contact in the event of an accident, what agency, what uh, medical facility, and the location of the communications equipment you're going to use to contact that agency. First thing we'll check is make sure they're not wet. If, if they're wet, uh, we'll hang them up to dry before we put them away. Uh, second, we'll check to make sure that there's no, no rips and tears in the webbing. Uh, small tears we can repair. If, uh, if a lot of the uh, webs are, are ripped, we'll have to send it back to the manufacturer and, and he'll repair it for us. And we'll check all the, the connections where the hooks go on. This particular one can be unscrewed, but it's, this one's tight. We'll look at all the other hooks, make sure the keepers are in good shape. And just, just sort of general, general condition. Winter conditions, uh, you, you're dealing with wind chill, first of all. Even on the bright sunny days, there's a wind chill out factor to consider. Uh, slippery conditions, ice, snow, deep snow, you know, especially at remote areas. Uh, blowing snow when the helicopter is hovering around, you're landing, taking off. You know, all, all those conditions you have to deal with. If you're, uh, if you're doing long line in snow, it's static electricity. Nobody wants to, to hang on to a load when it's just a few feet off the ground and gets zapped. And so uh, there's, uh, there's more attention paid to grounding the load. Then once it's uh, grounded, you can pick it up and slide it uh, into position without any problem. I've seen a person knock right off a load unconscious. They fell right off the top of a sling load to the ground. And it was the static, static charge that caused it. There are additional winter hazards when doing long line work. Footing um, is key. Uh, typically when you're working in snow and heavy equipment, it makes it that much more difficult to walk. So we ask the ground crews to either stamp out the, the drop zone. It's typically a four meter by four meter size area, um, which may potentially eliminate trips and falls. Also, that are, you know, typically you're working minus 10, minus 20, sometimes up to minus 30. Uh, that rotor wash uh, can make it feel like it's minus 40 or minus 50. So we ask the crews to watch each other for frostbite because quite often when you're working, you're not realizing that you're getting frostbite. Uh, vigilance and training, you can't go wrong with either. We've, we've covered a lot of the, the specific points. So uh, rather than belabor those, the only thing I can do is reinforce to to uh, stay very aware, and, and I hate to overuse that word, but uh, complacency is, is a terrible thing, particularly with crews who are veterans and who, or who have been on the job for a long time on any given day, that uh, it's worked fine for the past 50 pickups, there's no reason why it should be any different for the 51st. Well, there's, every time you start a new pickup operation, all the hazards that were there with number one are there with number 51. And that's the reason why you have to stay aware all the time. The biggest risk for the ground crew is to lose your situational awareness because it's, it's windy under there, it's loud, there's pressure to get the job done. Usually the risk comes from doing things too quickly and they remember they slip and, and fall or hurt themselves or, or cut themselves or get hit with the load because they don't know the load's coming, they turn their backs to the load. It's very important that you keep your eyes on the load or on the empty hook at all times when you're a ground crew member. <laughs>